All right, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, I'm just here to talk about a Hack Week project that I got to work on this year um, for Hack Week. So, um, yeah, the project was a, a Linux powered uh, USB security key. Well, that was the goal. Um, so, yeah, I'll just work through um, the motivation for the project, um, some goals that I had for, for Hack Week, um, a quick look at the implementation I did, um, and then if the demo gods permit, a, a live demo as well, and um, a look at sort of, yeah, future direction for the project potentially. So motivation, um, yeah, for Hack Week, it's, it's normally always the same. So I want to learn something new. I want to, yeah, try new projects, um, have a lot of fun and, yeah, innovate. So um, for me, I'd, I'd been playing around with Rust and used it for some projects, but I wanted to, to learn a bit more about it for this or with this Hack Week as well. Um, build system, so um, for embedded devices, um, I'd used OpenSUSE in the past, um, so there's a, a really uh, nice tumbleweed um, port for, for ARM boards, um, but it's, it's very much or much more general purpose, um, and for this project I wanted it to be um, quite minimal, so I decided to pick up Buildroot and play around with that. Um, I wanted to reuse existing hardware, so um, yeah, the, the state of e-waste these days is pretty depressing, so um, yeah, I wanted to work on something which could then potentially be used on, say, old phones or something like that. Um, and, yeah, also work on something which I might use myself, so something which could be helpful for me. So, yeah, goals for, for the project. Um, so I wanted to, to have it um, running on, yeah, basically as close to mainline as possible, so no ugly, you know, board support package um, from uh, the, the board vendors, um, just mainline U-Boot and, and Linux. Um, I didn't want much aside from... Uh, bootloader kernel and my application, so um, with, with BuildRoot that's pretty easy to do. Um, so I wanted the USB gadget then to um, yeah, create or expose a, a, um, an encrypted storage area, so for that I just wanted to use plain uh, dmcrypt. Um, I wanted to look at or evaluate existing um, FIDO2 or WebAuthn um, implementations um, so there are a couple interesting, um, I think I'll try and cover a little bit more later. I also wanted cross-platform support, so um, I wanted to be able to use it on my Android phone and my Linux laptop, um, potentially also then for, for others on, say, Windows or, or Mac OS or something like that. Um, and, yeah, I mentioned before, I wanted it to be as, as small as possible, so, um, yeah, really simple to understand, at least for me, and um, hopefully fast, so, um, yeah, having it boot as quickly as possible so that I can interact with the, with the gadget, um, yeah, without waiting around for, for it to boot. Um, yeah, simplicity also on the, the setup and, and use side, so, um, obviously, with, with the encrypt, um, at least for this project, I didn't want to store um, the key on the device itself, so, I needed to then expose some way of um, interacting with, uh, with the gadget to provide the, the password. Um, so I wanted um, just a simple uh, a web or offline web UI for that, um, which, which was actually surprisingly easy to do. Um, and then stretch goals, um, web USB, so that's a new technology um, or new standard for interacting from your browser with a USB device. Directly, it's it's quite uh, quite terrifying, but um, also kind of cool and interesting. So, um, and then also updates. So, um, if I'm pushing um, an update uh, to to a server, say, uh, it'd be nice to have um, the gadget then be able to to install that locally. So, the hardware I have, um, I mentioned, yeah, something I already had. So, it's it's. Quite old nowadays, it's around five years old or older. Um, it's a four by four centimeter um, AR64 board. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's got a few components which I don't really need for this project the um, Ethernet um, and USB host ports. 
But um, Ethernet came in handy for, for debugging anyway, and it's, of course, also got UART on there, so um, I had a serial console. Um, so now the, the application itself. So um, yeah, I mentioned um, with, uh, with BuildRoot, um, you basically pointed at um, a configuration for the bootloader, a kernel configuration. You tell it which kernel you'd like to use. Um, it then basically pulls toolchain down, um, pulls all of these, um, or the bootloader kernel uh, down as well, and, and builds it locally. Um, it's, I guess I'll touch on that later, but um, so I wanted it to, to boot or jump straight into the bootloader. I then wanted it to um, boot the kernel and expose this um, static website. So set up .html as, as a, a mass storage gadget. Um, and then from this website, um, we can um, input the password as a user and, and from that derive a, a key using the JavaScript, um, what's called Subtle Crypto API. Um, with that, we can then generate a, a configuration file. Um, so we can store some other preferences for the user there, at least on first boot or um, yeah, when we're unlocking subsequently. We can feed uh, then on the, once we get the configuration file to the gadget, um, which, is, which is done by saving the, the generated file to the, the mass storage, um, we can then um, feed that uh, key into uh, DM setup for the um, DMcrypt device. ButterFS, um, so there are a few reasons for using that, is then the backing or underlying storage for the um, the encrypted USB drive. Um, yeah, I wanted to have um, snapshots potentially as, as a feature, so have it snapshot when I plug in. Um, I also wanted uh, compression or inline compression of, of my data, so a, a little bit better space utilization for the, the SD card. Um, and then we can use XFAT as well to present it like a regular um, mass storage device, um, so the image atop ButterFS is then XFAT formatted or can be, and expose that finally as the final USB drive, and then also uh, with the hope that this encrypted storage can also be used for um, the uh, WebAuthn gadget as, as state for that. So, um, yeah, that's, I think, just a list of what I went through there. Um, this is what I have in the, the application itself. It basically just runs immediately um, after init. So I do have, um, like, BusyBox and some debugging utilities on, uh, on the image itself, but um, that's, at this stage, unnecessary if, if I were to, I think, take the project further. Um, and... Yeah, I think, yeah, one, one thing I'll mention is, is just on the um, configuration passing back to the gadget. Um, so what I have is I have, it's, it's quite an ugly hack, but works quite nicely. So I have um, the uh, USB gadget. Uh, I use a Rust a FATFS library. Um, and with that, I can basically read, concurrently read the, the FAT file system image on the gadget. Um, waiting or polling for the configuration file to arrive from, from the host. So, um, yeah, it's quite ugly to think of in that we have concurrent access, but um, I can use, or I use the, the um, web UI to generate a, a, a SHA-256 digest of the configuration file so that we know that when it does arrive, um, we have consistent data in the configuration file. Um, so, um, on to the demo. Here we go. So, I mentioned, yeah, fast was sort of a priority, so um, if you can see the lights blinking, um, then you should see the blue light sort of come on, and that's basically indicating that the app, or my app, has, has started, so it's sort of a second or so um, till it comes up. And we now have Oops, a USB mass storage device. Um, so hopefully I can bring that over. 
So for first boot, um, we just have this um, set up HTML. Uh, and if we open that, um, we get the, the first boot set up. So um, I have the password for the um, encrypted or for the encrypt, um, which is, um, yeah, uses a, a derived key. Um, and I have the, the settings for the um, underlying storage uh, or the, the ButterFS volume, which um, stores the, the image. So let's go put in a password. Um, I don't have a good keyboard now, so. Uh, no, th those keys don't work so well. <laughs> so <laughs> my USB keyboard just uh, didn't want to start. Use the on-screen keyboard. It'll be totally secret. The password is this is good. I just hope I have. Well, it'll tell me if they don't match anyway. So, so um, you can see just before I do save it. Um, so we do, oh, it's grayed out, but um, basically after password input or when we do the save, um, we then derive the uh, encryption key for deencrypt. Uh, we generate the configuration data as well as that SHA-256 digest. Um, and we then need to save this special line s.txt is the special file name, and that has to be stored in here for it to be processed by the, the gadget. So I'll go along and hit save. And so that then, once it's detected by the board, um, it then um, yeah, does the the crypt or DM setup? Um, does um, makeFS butterFS? Um, then does the image provisioning and makeFS xfat? Um, and now we have then the encrypted drive, which has just appeared locally here. So yeah, it's it's empty at the moment, but you can see. Uh, so this one is uh, then backed by the um, SD card. So uh, I didn't quite cover that earlier, but I have within the bootloader on first boot, um, it, it also does repartitioning of the SD card. So it claims basically the unused space from the end of the distro, which is like um, 32 mega megabytes. It's pretty tiny, um, or a fraction of that, um, and, and claims to the end of the device. So we could then also do um, have some fun with under or over provisioning um, for the image itself, especially given that we have snapshots and uh, compression to take into account. But at this stage, it's really basic and just does the same size as the partition. Um, yeah, so we can then, I guess, just to show you it's working. So this is my special encrypted data. So the encryption is, is of course, done by the, the gadget itself. So the um, USB host is just interacting with a regular XFAT um, file system. And we can remove. And yeah, that's the first boot setup. Um, and then for, I guess, subsequent boot, yeah, we still have time. So normal boot, um, it's the same UI, so I haven't really done or made that many changes to, to the static website at this stage. Um, uh, but um, yeah, we, we just need to, to gather the, the password from the user and then derive the encryption key. One thing I also didn't mention is um, for the derived key, um, uh, we need some salt as well, so um, for that, what I do is I use, uh, I have the, the U-boot partitioner running on first boot, and that is capable of genera generating random UUIDs um, for the GPT um, partition table. So I reuse those random UUIDs. Um, it's not great, I think, in terms of entropy and, yeah. Um, but it, it works, and it's hack week, so. <laughs> um, 
yeah, I guess I'll unplug and, and plug back in to show the regular boot. So we should see it appear again here. There we go. Um, so, hang on. That's some bogus caching, I think. Yeah, there we go. I think that's um, KDE. I'm not too sure. I need to look a bit closer at that. Um, so here we have unlock.html. So instead of set up HTML just for the subsequent boots, we have this unlock HTML. That's really the only difference at this stage. Um, so otherwise, I have the same, or we'll reuse the same UI. Um, uh, we're only really interested in the, the password at this stage. So. We can do that. Um, again, we put the special config file in the special path that's needed. And whoop, there we can see the drivers arrived again. And there's the file we created. So um, it worked. <laughs> Oops. Um, so yeah, with that, um, just sort of a look at, ah, sorry. So look at um, where it could potentially go in future. Um, yeah, actually that shouldn't be in the future section, but yeah, um, it really needs, or at least one of the main goals of this project was that I wanted to, to play around with um, WebAuthn and, and FIDO2. And like I set up the encrypted drive and had uh, an area for that stage. Um, I, did, I did look at, um, so two projects, um, Soft FIDO, um, which uses, uh, I think it's libhsm2. Um, yeah, that was a little bit ugly in that, um, so libhsm2 is, is pretty huge. Um, and yeah, it had uh, so uh, USB IP support, which is nice for debugging, but um, a bit unnecessary for um, this, this gadget. Um, since then, I've found this OpenSK project, and that looks really promising. Um, so that targets, um, like really uh, low power embedded boards, uh, like um, Cortex M4, tiny, um, yeah, low power boards. And it runs on uh, a, I think it's called TOC OS or a Rust, um, yeah, minimal operating system, but there has been work to port that to run just as a, a regular application on Linux. Um, so it would just be a matter of um, plumbing that into, uh, yeah, the Linux U2F functionality. Um, yeah, raw deencrypt, so um, not everyone wants snapshots and compression, um, so we could, uh, yeah, just expose the raw deencrypt device. Um, I mentioned, yeah, the snapshots are created on, um, yeah, plug-in, but there's no life cycle, so they just accumulate. Um, that needs to be um, looked at. Um, web USB, um, so that would make it a little bit nicer in that um, we wouldn't need this um, FAT file system slot for passing the configuration file between the host and the gadget. Um, so we could still do that offline as well in that we could have, say, the, the static website still exposed via mass storage, but then um, use web USB uh, just to, to yeah, provide the configuration back to the device. Um, it would be 
I think a bit more user friendly, um, but yeah, it, it then would tie the project to uh, Chromium based browsers at this stage. Um, simple updates, so given that we have the web UI, it'd be quite simple to, to pull the server um, if we have internet access, um, just to update the board or um, propagate the update payload with the, the config. And then also, um, yeah, potentially look at other hardware. So um, this is an old USB 2 board. Um, yeah, something more performance, so USB 3 would be nice. Um, open source hardware options. Um, there are two that I know of which look good for this project. Um, so there's the Beagle board, I think Pocket Beagle um, would be quite cool because it has a, a button too, which is important for uh, uh, WebAuthn. And um, there's a Pine OX64, I think it is, which is relatively new. That's a, a RISC-V based board, which is also Interesting. And then personal lessons. Um, yeah, for me, uh, it was fun to play around with build root, so it was completely new for me. And um, given that it sort of feels just a lot like the uh, Linux kernel config um, sort of procedure, or, um, yeah, it, it felt quite quite easy to sort of get started. But um, yeah, as I mentioned, it sort of pulls all sorts of things down from the internet um, and, and compiles without sort of checking um, source verification. So I actually used a different um, uh, laptop for this project just because I didn't want to have it on the SUSE network. So, um, and the, the user experience, um, yeah, I, I think I learned that um, like using static web pages for generating um, say, configuration file data, even offline, is, is quite easy to do um, and quite user-friendly. Um, and Rust, yeah, it was, was fun doing another project in Rust. Um, for embedded stuff, so there are some really good things there on the embedded side because there's this no standard um, flag where you can build things without the, the standard library. So that, um, you know, filtering for these projects, you can really see that people go to a lot of effort of, of trimming down um, the size of their applications. Uh, but then on the other side, um, yeah, the uh, regular Rust applications, I think the cargo dependencies sort of get a bit out of hand. Um, it's really easy to sort of snowball into something just huge. Um, so you need to sort of keep a, a close eye on, on what's being pulled in by cargo. And... Yeah, that's it. I uh, can't really read my thanks there. But, um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Didn't check this slide. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, any questions? Hello. So, as you would know, I work on a lot of WebAuthn things, so I have lots of questions and comments, but the main one is just that with what is your planned use case here? Are you planning to use this for work or are you planning to use this for personal? Uh, I, I wouldn't feel right doing it, using it for work. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's just a, a really hacky project. And yeah, I think for WebAuthn, like, you shouldn't need to input a password, right? So you should have... You do, actually, because user verification is now a thing, and, and with the way that WebAuthn is going, they've kind of actually ditched using security keys as a second factor, and they're now self-contained multi-factor, so you actually need to do, like, PIN or some kind of verification, and that's embedded in the cryptographic signature that that's being performed on the device. Mm. So you probably do actually need to think about that in the future. With OpenSK, you should do it for you, though. Mm. But there's, there's stuff for handling handling that, but... Interesting. So we could then derive a key from the decrypt key as well for. It gets more complicated than that, and it's probably better for a conversation. Unless everyone wants it on the recording <laughs> on how this works. But oh, let's let's do it in the hallway. But yeah. we can do it in the hallway. But the TLDR is that you generally need to derive a per relying party key, mm. and so your decrypt is just for secure storage. Yeah. But every single website needs its own key because else companies like uh, certain very large. American vendors will track you everywhere. Mm. So, yeah. 
Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd love to come, chat. Come and come yeah. talk to me after because I have lots of good feedback for you. Great. <laughs> Uh, anyone else? Otherwise, I guess that's it. Thanks. <laughs>